Well, good morning, Calvary. Hey, grab your Bibles with me, if you would, please, and turn to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, so glad you're here today. Welcome not only to those of you here in the sanctuary, but also those of you who may be joining us in Auditorium 2. Maybe you're coming to us by way of television or online or the podcast. So glad that you are here today. You, you, might, uh, you might hear me say those things every week and just kind of tune them out, but it is so cool um, to see the ways that God uses technology to spread his word all over. And uh, whether it be television you're joining us, or I just met some friends that have been joining us from Wisconsin recently, and just all over the, all over the let's just say all over the world, how's that sound? And uh, so thank you so much for being here. Back before the pandemic, does anybody remember before the pandemic? You remember we, we took a very long time as a church to go through the book of Acts. Does anybody remember that? Like we, we took our time, kind of like what we have started doing in, in the Gospel of Matthew. We took a break for the summer, um, but the second week of September, what's that, the 10th, we're gonna jump back in to Matthew. We're gonna look at chapters eight and nine. I'm stoked about this. We're gonna do a series called Never the Same. And have you realized that once you encounter Jesus Christ, you're never the same and that's what we're going to see in those stories. And I, I really think there's going to be some weeks, and we'll, we'll talk about this as we get closer. You're going to want to invite your friends and family to be here and experience what I think God has in store for us as we move into that. We, we did the same thing with the book of Acts several years ago. And in 2018, June and July of 2018, we took four weeks to center in on Acts chapter 15. And I'll, I'll tell you why here in just a minute. And out of that four weeks, uh, June and July 2018, we did a series called Trending, where we looked at some of what were the, the, the toughest and kind of most difficult trending topics of that time. We talked about alcohol, we talked about sex, we talked about social media, we talked about a lot of things that were relevant then, still very relevant now. And as you know, we're, we're kind of looking back, we're revisiting some messages that we looked at in the past, and we've done that the last couple of weeks. We've got one more next week. Today, we're gonna do the first sermon from that series that kind of set as an overview what we were looking at. And today, what we're gonna talk about, and just gonna use a little analogy, is the GPS that God has given to us. But before we get to why we're calling it a GPS, let me give you some backstory on the, on the book of Acts. If you're not familiar with, with this book, in the New Testament, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the four biographies, if you will, of Jesus. It tells the story of Jesus' life. Then we have the book of Acts, which is a historical book that also gives us rich theology of the story of the first church from the death and resurrection of Jesus kind of on up through really almost the very end of the Apostle Paul's life when he was imprisoned. And so it tells us this story the first, we'll just call it half. It's really about the first 13 chapters, but the first half of the book of Acts focuses primarily in Jerusalem, Judea. This is the Jewish world that the first disciples came out of. So even though they had a lot of difference of opinion, even though people didn't like who they said Jesus was, they shared a lot of the same things. They had the same scriptures. They had the same temple. In theory, they all worshiped the same God. And so there was this unique background that they all shared when the church was in Jerusalem. When you get to Acts chapter 13 and then on, the second half, what happens is the church leaves Jerusalem and then goes out into the broader world. We know a lot of these cities that they end up in because they're titles to letters that are written later in the New Testament. Places like where the letters to Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, Corinthians, all those places that you've heard of, right? So they went out into the wider world. Why is this important? Well, when they were in Jerusalem, they had one reality. But when they went out into the wider world, it changed. Jerusalem was mostly just Jewish people. It was kind of, they were comfortable. They, they thought the same way. But when they left Jerusalem and Judea, they ended up in Gentile territory. So now instead of just worshiping one God, these people worshiped many gods. And instead of having one temple, they had many temples. Instead of everybody agreeing on the Old Testament scriptures, they really kind of just found themselves in a place where they could believe whatever they wanted. In fact, they shared a common moral code in Jerusalem, but now when they were out in the wider world, anything would go. In fact, much of their immorality was actually tied to what they believed in their spirituality. And so you can see that Jerusalem was one world, 
And the rest, of it, well, let's just even just use the example of Ephesus at the end of the book of Acts. Ephesus was a totally different world. And where you needed the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem, you really needed the Holy Spirit in Ephesus because there were a lot of unholy spirits there. Does that make sense? Jerusalem and let's just say Ephesus, two very different worlds. Here's my contention, that you and I who are followers of Jesus Christ, who are, maybe you've even been a part of the church for a long time, we don't live in Jerusalem anymore. The world looks a lot more like Ephesus than it does Jerusalem. True? People live how they want. Where once there was this common belief in Scripture or at least a familiarity with God's Word, we now in many ways have a culture that pushes back and ignores the teachings and truths of God's Word, diminishes them, says they're not relevant today. And in many ways, we are encountering and having to make decisions that we didn't when our little worlds looked more like Jerusalem, but today they look a lot more like Ephesus, true? So what does that mean? Well, that means you and I (laughs) then have to think a little bit differently about the ways that we live because we don't live in Jerusalem anymore. This was the crossroads that the church came to in Acts chapter 15. They realized that the world was changing around them, so they would have to answer some pretty important questions. Acts chapter 15, here's what happens. Let's, let's start with verse one. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch. And so Judea, right, that's, that's where Jerusalem is. Antioch, that looks a whole lot more like the rest of that Gentile world. And they were teaching the believers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Well, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. We don't have time to fully unpack everything that was there, but here you kind of had the the first general council of the church that was being called. Leaders from all over were coming together because they had to settle this, because there were some people who were going to the believers and saying, unless you do this and do that, you can't be saved. Yes, you have to believe in Jesus, but you also have to. It was like you also have to live a certain way. You have to do this. In that instance, they wanted to follow the Jewish practice of circumcision. So instead of saying they were saved by Jesus alone, they were saying that you had to have Jesus plus to be saved. Does that make sense? Right? So this, this was an issue. And what we're going to see in Acts 15 is two important questions. Let me give them to you. They're, they're two important questions for us to consider from Acts chapter 15. One, we're going to do a drive-by on. The second one, we're going to spend a little more time on. Two important questions. Here's the first one. Number one, how is a person saved? Acts chapter 15, this is a question. If someone is going to be right with God, number one, how is a person saved? And number two, how does a saved person live? And when you've gone from Jerusalem to Ephesus, you can see why that's an important question, right? Not only, number one, how's a, sa- how's a person saved? But number two then, how does a saved person live? This was extremely important. And it wasn't just important then. I think it's extremely important today. Because there's always been times and items in the church that cause us to ask these questions. People want to know, how do I get right with God And then once I am, how do I live my life? What does a life look like of someone who is right with God? And oftentimes, at least my church experience is, and scripture talks about this idea of holiness. You ever heard that word? Like what does it mean to be holy, to live the way that God would have you to? And it can be in things like how we dress, and it can be as practical as how we run a church. What are proper standards in our personal and corporate life? What are our personal tastes? How does this affect everything in the Bible we see from food and drink to marriage and sex and everything in between? Now, now we don't have any time to summarize every detail of this, but let me answer the first question real quick for you. The first question is, how is a person saved? And that got sorted out initially uh, throughout the scriptures, and then you see it here in Acts 15, and then later Paul writes about it. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight. Paul says this, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So here's what we see from that scripture. You'll see it when you read Acts chapter 15, that salvation comes through faith alone in Jesus Christ and not by Jesus plus. Salvation comes through faith alone in Jesus Christ and not by Jesus plus. 
you don't have to clean up your act first. You don't have to make sure you get everything right. You don't have to be perfect and then come to God. We are not saved by our works. It's by his grace and through faith alone. Aren't you glad for that? Now, I don't, I don't know what your background was, though, because for a lot of us, our faith traditions, whether it's said explicitly or not, kind of make it feel like to, ex- to experience salvation from Jesus, then we also have to add these things. And whether you call it legalism, you call it expectations, you call it whatever, it might not be the Jewish customs that we read about in the first century, but it is things that we put a weight on ourselves where we make it seem like we're responsible for our salvation just as much or more than Jesus. There, there was a, a story that, that hit the news about Massachusetts State Police as they were out patrolling, they came across the guy and they, they pulled him over because of the lack of safety that was considered with his vehicle. In fact, we'll pull up the picture here. This is the vehicle that they pulled over, <laughs> transporting a massive amount of furniture. Some of you look at that and literally you go, so? I've done it. And so they posted a picture online, the Massachusetts State Police did, that said, ask yourself, what could go wrong? (laughs) Right? And somebody commented on it, which I thought was interesting. I'm speechless. So glad he was stopped before any of his cargo caused a major accident. But I bet he's really good at Jenga. (laughs) But you look at that picture and you go, that doesn't make any sense. And yet some of our faith traditions look a lot like that where we say, well, let's add one more thing, or let's expect this, or don't do this, or don't do that. Like some of us grew up in, in environments where there's just a lot of rules and do's and don'ts. And the scriptures are very clear about how we should live. Look, salvation is not something you earn. It's not Jesus plus, it's by faith alone. But that then takes us to the second question. The first question is, how is a person saved? Well, it is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But once you're saved then, number two, how does a saved person live? This was really the critical question that came to the leaders of the church in Acts chapter 15, right? What does it mean to live out your faith in a world that doesn't look like Jerusalem anymore? So here's what they wrote, Acts chapter 15, verse 20. They said, instead we should write to them, meaning we need to give instructions to the churches. Let's write a letter to the churches telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. Do you ever have those verses that you read and go, I don't get it. I'm going to chapter 16, right? And you just, you move right past. This is one of those, right? Because you're like, that's, honestly, it's weird. And so that was for them, it's not for me, so I'll just kind of keep moving. The truth is, what they're communicating to the church here is critically important. And once you understand the context behind it, you go, oh, okay. That matters to me today as well. Look, we are saved by faith and not works. But our faith affects our works once we are saved. So how we believe is gonna affect how we live. This is what they're writing to them about. So what happens is the leaders in the church say, well, we gotta communicate this. They didn't have YouTube. They didn't have social media, right? They didn't have email. So what they had to do was just use mail and they wrote a letter and then they tagged some people who were leaders in the church and said, we want you to take this and then take this letter. It's kind of the the conclusion, if you will, that the church leaders reached and take it to the churches so that they can hear and understand because there was this question everywhere. So look at this, Acts chapter 15, verse 23. With them, with these leaders, the messengers, they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. These were the ones who were challenging them about how to be saved. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we are sending Judas. Now, this is a different Judas from the story about Jesus, right? So different guy, I don't want you to get confused. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm the word by word of mouth what we are writing. So they write to them here about what it means for someone to be saved. And then they say this in verse 28. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit 
and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. I love that line. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Have you ever done anything that seemed good to you and didn't bother to check with the Holy Spirit? <laughs> That's a whole nother sermon, actually. It's a, it's, a, it's a good way to live. He says, look, we don't want to burden you, so if we're going to tell you how a saved person lives, let's give you the following requirements. Uh, verse 29. You are to, and, and remember these, these four things. You are to abstain from food sacrifice to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. <laughs> Shorten to the point, right? Verse 30. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. And the people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. We read it and go, huh? But the people were glad for its encouraging message. Why? Aren't you glad when you get clarity? Aren't there times you go, I don't know what to do. I don't understand. I'm not sure how to handle this. Like friends, we live in a world that culturally is upside down. Morality is topsy-turvy. And you and I have these moments where we go, what am, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to believe? How, how am I supposed to interact with these people? How am I supposed to vote? How am I supposed to, how am I supposed to anybody? Like, and we go, how do we know? Well, what they got was clarity, and there is encouragement in clarity that comes from God's word. So what I hope this will give us today is a little encouragement and a little clarity from God's word. Because even though these were items that applied 2,000 years ago, we need clarity today, True. Right In a world that is so full of social media ideas and thoughts, what does it mean to raise Christian children in our culture? What does it mean to be holy? How do we deal with hot topics like drugs and alcohol and marijuana and identity and gender and sexual morality and all these things? And people asking the question, is holiness changing? Like is the idea of living a life according to God's word just old fashioned? I mean, these are questions that we have to ask. And it's interesting, too, because I, I don't know how you grew up, but in some churches, when it comes to these issues, you're given a tool to help you, but the only tool you have is a hammer. And if the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a... And so you just, no, 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 no. Anybody grow up there? It was like, you're playing whack-a-mole? That was awesome. I don't know what I was doing there, but... And everything looks like a hammer, and you're just, no, all the time, Right? How is a person saved? Question number one, through faith in Jesus Christ alone. But how does a saved person live? And you have to make those decisions. You have to deal with those questions. Everything from how you're gonna respond to temptation, to what you believe about the messages in culture, to how your actions affect the people around you. How do I know how to live, and what help do we get? <laughs> Stay away from meat sacrifice to idols, no strangling, no blood, no sexual immorality. I mean, it's just kinda hard to understand some of that. When I'm on a journey, I often need help to know how I'm gonna get there, right? So we used to read maps, do you remember that? Which now that I look back at what I did with maps sometimes, it was not safe. And so we used to, did anybody have triptychs? Do you remember the triptychs? Man, I loved it. My dad would let me hold that thing and get a paper cut. It was awesome. And then we eventually were able to print out maps on MapQuest. I thought we were so cool. My printer was always low on ink, and so the directions were faded, but praise God we got there. And then we got a GPS. And the GPS helps us to get where we are going. Here's what I want to give you for these, these moments when you realize I'm not in Jerusalem anymore. I want to give you a GPS for how to live. A GPS from God's word, from this passage of scripture, actually in Acts 15, a GPS for how to live. And each one of those letters is gonna stand for something. So the letter G, well, the letter G always stands for, anybody? <laughs> God, right? So the letter G is God, and then the letter P is going to be people, and then the letter S is gonna be self. If you're gonna have a GPS for knowing how to live, then we're gonna run this through this, this filter, this analogy, if you will, of God, people, and self. Now look, every analogy falls apart at some point when we try to help us to understand things. But I, I like this one because it's based on a connection to something higher than you, right? And it shows where you are and where you're headed and how you're gonna get there. 
and you have options that help you to have clarity to make the most of your decisions and can keep you informed in real time. And here's why this is important to me. Because as a church, we could just tell you how to live. Do this, don't do that. Don't do this and do that. And we could, we could do that, but inevitably something weird's gonna come up that's not gonna apply, right? And at some point, you don't just need to be told what to do. I need to know how to make decisions for myself. How do I listen to the Holy Spirit? How am I led in those critical moments? How do I understand why these things are important? My grandma was a woman of God, Agnes Gilligan, and I'm so thankful for um, the influence that my grandma had in my life, but she, she was quite old school, and she made it very clear from the time I was young, no movies, no playing cards, no dancing. I'm not quite sure why. She was a nice lady, but she just had a hammer. No movies. Why? Because what if Jesus comes back while you're in there watching Toy Story? Right? No cards. Those are used for gambling. Not quite sure about the dancing, but apparently dancing makes you pregnant. I don't know. I just know we didn't do it. Right, and what happens is if you only have rules without reasons, they become irrelevant. Rules without reasons become irrelevant. I don't wanna just give you rules. I wanna give you a tool that's gonna help you when you have to make decisions. So let's talk about using our GPS. The letter G is God, and here's why. One of the things that they said in that letter is stay away from meat sacrifice to idols. Why? There's a lot of cultural things here, but here's the bottom line. What is an idol? Anything that takes the place of God. And if your attention, if, if your decision making, if the things that are priority in your life come from anywhere other than first what God thinks or what God says, you're on the wrong course, true? And so what they're saying is the very first thing when you're making decisions, when you're making choices, stay away from those idols. So here's this, when, when you come to a crossroads like this, ask this question, does this decision or action glorify God? What I am about to do, what I'm about to say, how I am about to believe, what I think about what's going on in the world around me, how I'm gonna respond to this temptation, if you will, does this decision or action glorify God? What does God's word say about it? Am I obeying him? Is, is this pleasing to God? Does this represent God well to others? Does it make others wanna know who God is? We read this, Colossians chapter three, verse 17. In whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So word or deed, make sure God's at the center. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, so whether you eat or drink, I love how practical this gets. When you, when you read that passage, you understand it. So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So when you're making a decision, you kind of have to ask the question, is God glorified through this? And oftentimes we say, God, I want your blessings. God, I want your favor. God, I want you to give me this. And God, I want you to help me with that. But you must care about what God thinks to receive what God has to say. Like oftentimes, I just want what his word says. Lord, just give it to me. And he's like, well, have you, have you stopped to think about what I think about this and how you're living and the choices you're making? So you must care about what God thinks to receive what God has to say. And yet for so many of us, we're so quick to just want to do it on our own. It's not as big a deal around here. It's a little bit bigger deal I think right now on the west coast I'm sure it's going to spread over time but there's kind of this technological focus on self-driving automobiles have you seen any of this the driverless cars would you get in one? Oh wow okay yeah we were going to get a fleet for the church but never mind <laughs> wow 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 yeah and um, some of you though I just want to say I've seen you drive it might be an improvement so we're going to just uh, <laughs> leave it at that praise God um, if technology helps you move over. It's, it's, they're starting to use it with taxis and stuff, and San Francisco is a, a good example. This last week, it was all set up. They had the cones, they had the flags, they had the people, the whole bit, and this driverless car drove right into a construction area and got stuck in wet concrete. 
Which, of course, the driverless car people are like, well, it was just a fluke, you know. And the non-driverless car people are saying, see, told you. You know, it's one of those moments. Now, look, I'm not making a statement one way or the other. I'm just saying I read that and resembled it. Because there's times when I try to do it on my own and end up stuck. You and I were never intended to be in the driver's seat. God was. And he's the one who created us. And he's the one who knows better. And when I try to do it on my own, I get stuck more times than not. Anybody? (laughs) I need his help. So the very first thing I've got to do when I come to these, these moments in life where I realize, wow, I'm not in Jerusalem anymore, when I come to crossroads, when I have to make decisions for my family, or I have to make decisions in my job, or I have to make decisions about my spiritual life, first thing is this. Is God glorified in this? Like, what does God think? What does his word have to say? Here's the, here's the second one. If, if G is God in GPS, the letter P is people. The letter P is people. Why is this important? The, the part that we skip over, you can kind of understand meat sacrifice to idols. But then in Acts 15, do you remember the letter, these two things where they say, stay away from meat that has been strangled and from blood. Blood I'm cool with. <laughs> but I don't understand that. Why? Well, in the church, you would have Jewish people who had one set of customs, especially around what they would eat and how they would eat, and you had Gentile people who had another set of customs, and what they would often do, especially as churches were meeting in homes, they wouldn't just have communion like we do, right? Where you get a little piece of bread, and you get a little cup, and you just kind of share communion that way. They would have communion, and then they'd have this whole meal together. And then the Gentiles are bringing this pepperoni pizza, and it's not really what's on the Jewish menu. Are you with me? And they're like, well, I can't eat that. In fact, what's wrong with you? Don't you love God? And they're like, what's wrong with you? Don't you love pizza? And then they're trying to figure all this out, and it would cause this conflict within the church so that now these people were at odds with each other. They were struggling with each other, even to the point that because they couldn't agree, some of them were walking away from the faith. Does that make sense? So the question here is not so much, what kind of pizza are you eating? The question is, how is this affecting other people? Here's, here's, if you're gonna get to that letter P for people, think of this. Does this decision or action encourage or discourage other people? Does this decision, what I'm about to do, what I'm about to say, how I'm about to live, is this gonna discourage or encourage other people? Is it offensive to someone? whose faith may be in a different place than mine? Am I treating them and their ideas with respect? Or am I causing them to stumble in their faith? Is my life showing them who Jesus is? This is something that Paul has to address. He addresses it in the book of Romans. He addresses it in in 1 Corinthians. He he says this, 1 Corinthians 9, 19, though I am free and belong to no one, which insert, I can eat any pizza I want, (laughs) I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Paul says, look, I I can do anything I want, but sometimes I choose not to, because I'm more concerned about you than I am myself. Does that make sense? Do you remember remember when you were in school and you had rules? Like, um, don't pull the chair out from underneath the person in front of you? Do you remember those rules? You don't pull somebody's hair. The one that always got me, I think I've talked about this before, was I was always a bit of a tall kid, and I'd be riding the school bus, and you're crammed in there, and at some point, it's just like, I just gotta stretch my leg out. At which point, my bus driver, on a daily basis, Chad, get your feet out of the aisle. This real sweet lady. (laughs) Get your feet out of the aisle. And I was just like, you know what? In my salvation, I am free to put my foot wherever I want. I have this freedom. I am confined. This is not, I am going to stretch my, get your feet out of the aisle. 
You know what I wish she'd have said? Chad, dear, when your foot's in the aisle, you become a trip hazard. And I know you feel like you can extend it however you like willy-nilly, but you may not because you may trip someone coming or going. Now, you never intended to trip anybody, but the choices you make might actually get in the way of someone who's on a journey and isn't as stable as you are. So I am asking you, Chad, dear, to retract your leg in grace. I still close my eyes at night and hear, get your foot out of the aisle. <laughs> but do you understand the difference? Did I want to trip anybody? No. I'm just trying to be comfortable. I'm just trying to live my best life on the way to Southington Elementary School. <laughs> but what I was really doing was putting myself out there in a way that other vulnerable or weaker people could have experienced some real pain that might even have caused them to fall. And oftentimes, I just need to understand that how I live my life impacts other people, and it may be that I withdraw some of my own freedom and privilege because that might be the very thing that keeps someone else from falling. Does that make sense? Look, the actions of your life act upon the lives of others. You, you don't live in a bubble. The way you live, the things you say, they affect your family, they affect your friends, they affect the church. 1 Corinthians 10, 32, Paul goes on to say this, do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. When I was in high school, I worked with a guy who had, have you ever heard the phrase sex, drugs, and rock and roll? That had been his life. I mean, he, he had lived that to the full. And then he found Jesus, and Jesus found him. And his life was just so transformed. I mean, like, literally, the phrase radically saved, that was this dude. And so as I was working with him, I was like, hey, man, you should listen to some of this music that I listened to, like the Christian rock of that time. I was like, oh, you'd love these guys. Let me loan you this CD, and you, you would love it. And one day he just said to me, he goes, man, I appreciate it. He says, but I, I really don't want to listen to your music he says, the problem is when, right now, when I listen to that music, it makes me want to listen to my old music. And when I listen to my old music, it makes me want to go back and do the old things I used to do. And I don't want to do those things anymore. So here's your music back. And that's when I said to him, would you just grow up? No, I didn't. <laughs> Nor should you. Because he was at a place right there where he was vulnerable. Does that make sense? Sometimes we're just in a place where we're vulnerable. And there was nothing wrong with the music I was listening to. But in that vulnerable season, it was not right for him to listen to it because of where it would have taken him. And you and I have to keep that in mind that there are people around us that even though you might be free to do whatever you want, that that freedom could actually hurt someone else told you a couple weeks ago, I'm working on a writing project, and one of the major parts of this is the idea that we pass on our faith from one generation to the next. And can I tell you, friends, almost 30 years of ministry, working with, with um, kids for a major portion of that time, watching the lives of students from the time they were young until they go out into life on their own, one of the most damaging things that can happen to a child's faith is to see things in the life of their parents that just don't add up to see hypocrisy, to see things they can't make sense of, to see choices and decisions that just don't seem to line up with the things that they're hearing from God's word or the things that you might be saying that come out of your mouth. Parents, grandparents, I don't know what your freedom is. Just know that everything you say and do is either helping or hindering that faith being passed on to the next generation. Now look, your kids, your grandchildren, they're, they're gonna make those decisions for themselves, right? You don't make those for them. They make their own faith decisions. I just know I don't wanna make it any harder than it needs to be as we pass that faith along. Back in the 1840s, there was a, a Hungarian doctor named Ignaz Semmelweis, and he worked in a hospital that was um, primarily focused on delivering babies. And what they noticed was they were having, almost in like, scary numbers, women who would give birth and then they would pass away with what was called childbed fever in that time. 
And they were trying to figure out why are so many women dying in our hospital? And there was also a relationship that they had with this midwives clinic. And what they noticed as they looked at the numbers is that the women that went to the midwives clinic were living a lot more than the women that were coming to, to the hospital, almost five to one. And they're trying to figure out what is going on here. So this doctor started thinking about it. And he's like, I don't, I don't fully understand this. He says, the only difference between our hospital and that clinic is the fact that over here we do autopsies as well. Now look, you didn't, you didn't have a, a scientific system that understood germs the way we do today. But this doctor looked at this and said, the only thing I can figure is that when we're doing autopsies, we're taking particles of death and then we're transferring them over to these mothers as they're giving birth. And that as we take the death from here and transfer it over there, what we have on our hands is literally killing these other people. So he said, you know what we're gonna start doing? We're gonna start washing our hands. The Bible says, thou shalt wash thy hands, does it not? Well, I don't know about that. It's a good idea though. And they started washing their hands and that death rate <laughs> declined dramatically. Now look, he may not have understood all of the science, but what he knew was we need to make sure that what we have on our hands that we transfer on to the people we care for is life, not death. So when you come to these crossroads, parents, when you're making decisions about how you live and how you live out your freedom and what you do in the future, make sure that what you're passing on to others is life and not death. It's on our GPS, right? The letter G is God. That's when they were talking about meat sacrificed to idols. The letter P is people. Remember we talked about the, the strangled animals, the blood, those things. Well, that's because I'm, I'm gonna care about other people. How does this affect other people, not just me? So the GP, the letter S, is self. And this really comes down to what they were talking about with sexual immorality, right? They said, hey, steer clear of sexual immorality because you have this new church and you have these people coming out of a idolatrous culture that was worshiping all these different idols and all these different false gods and tied up in all of that religion for many of them was sexual immorality. And they're saying, look, we want you to grow in your faith. We don't want you to grow away from God. We want you to grow closer to God. So when it comes time for you to live your life, how does a saved person live? Here's a question that you should ask about yourself. Would this decision or action cause me to be closer to or further away from God? Consider this, would this decision or action cause me to be closer to or further away from God? And I happen to think, you ever heard the phrase, you're, you're either taking one step forward or two steps back? And so many times if we're not moving closer to God, I think the natural tendency is for us to be pulled further from him. Hebrews chapter three, verse 12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Like watch what's going on in your heart that it doesn't pull you away from him. First Corinthians 10, 12. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. And I think for many of us, that's a good word. Because we think, oh, I'm, I'm good. Everything's all right. I, 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 I can live this way. I can make these decisions. I, I, I know I'm okay. But be careful that you don't fall. There's a quote by Charles Spurgeon that says this. I believe that one reason why the church of God at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. That's, that's a thought-provoking statement, isn't it? Charles Spurgeon said that that was at this present moment. <laughs> the present moment was 131 years ago when he spoke that. Do you think it's just as relevant or more today? And so you and I have to ask the question, is this pulling me closer or is the way I'm living causing me to be further away from God? And this is tricky because typically we usually don't just jump by leaps from close to God to far away. Let's just, let's just imagine that over here is where you're kind of far from God. 
and over here is where you're close to him. And usually we don't just, just jump from one place to the other. It usually kind of happens by steps, doesn't it? We just kind of slowly move and we let our attentions go a, a certain way or we start thinking certain things or it's, it's what we put into our minds or our bodies or our families or our lives. It's just what we watch or listen to or it's how we think or it's the, it's, it's the temptation that comes and sometimes it's not even bad things but it's just these things. I mean, we, I, I still got hold of God. I'm just, I'm just you know, I'm just kind of living my life and then eventually you're just, oh, I'm still kind of reaching. I'm still watching him. I'm still, and it just kind of happens step by step to where we find ourselves. We might not even realize it but there's this greater distance between us and God. Do you know what I'm talking about? And it kind of happens in this until slowly we're just, oh, he's, he's not that far, and I, it's all good, and I'm, until we eventually find ourselves in a very dark place and realize that even though we never intended to, we just gradually slipped away from that relationship that we once had where we cared what he thought, where we looked out for the best interests of others, where we were making sure we stayed close to ourselves. Isn't this true about relationships? Like you don't just wake up one day and decide I'm gonna have conflict with my family member. It's true about marriage. You usually don't decide to get a divorce overnight. And the same thing happens with our relationship with God. Distance often happens by steps, not leaps. And some of us, as I say that, you know that your life right now looks a whole lot more like this than it does over there. Or you might even say, Chad, I found myself in a, spiritually in a pretty dark place. And maybe today's a day when you start taking those steps, maybe even you start running in God's direction. And that's okay. Look and understand that sometimes I have to make these decisions based on the fact that sometimes I'm more vulnerable than others. Does that make sense? Like there's sometimes when, when listening to that song or going to that place or being around that person, it's not that it's a sin, I just know I'm more vulnerable right now to the draw of the enemy or to temptation or to the things that would not please God. And there's just moments when I gotta go, yeah, that's just not right for me right now. You wouldn't take a baby that's a newborn out into a crowded place, would you? They're too vulnerable. There are places that those who have immunity challenges should not go. And there are moments in your life where you just need to say, not me, not now, because I'm afraid it might pull me further away from God if I'm not careful. Look, there are a lot of things that, that come into our lives in different seasons. And you and I live in a world that I think on a daily basis looks less and less like Jerusalem. True? But if that's true, then how do I live my life? How do I make decisions? I think you need a GPS for how to live. The G is God, and you say, God, does this glorify you? Does this please you? The P is people. How is this gonna affect? Is this gonna encourage or discourage others? And the S is self. Is this gonna move me closer to or further away from God? And one of those may have just kind of resonated in literally in your spirit today. Don't ignore that GPS because it could save you a lot of heartache down the road. Our family was on vacation and we had been down at the beach in South Carolina and we were on our way back and we were going through a very rural part of West Virginia and as we were traveling, our GPS said, get off the highway I was like, I don't want to get off the highway. I'm cruising. I'm moving. There is nothing here. I don't want to get off. But for whatever reason, and I'm, I'm glad I listened to it, and all of a sudden, we ended up just like literally out in the middle of nowhere, and we're taking all these crazy curves, and we're going up and down, and you can look down the cliff the side of the road, and you're like, what? my family's like, what are we doing? Why are we here? Why is this happening? And all of a sudden, I found myself on these um, country roads that I was hoping would take me home, <laughs> like to the place where I belong, right? Are you with me? And I'm like, why are we, why did the GPS take me this way? And then we came up to a point, you know, because we were, we, were, we were off in the woods, but we were literally driving alongside the highway. And then we got to a point where there was an exit to get back on the highway. And what we saw was traffic backed up for miles. And so we just stayed on the country roads, took us to a next exit, still traffic backed up. We went three exits up before we finally saw that we were past the accident or the construction or whatever it was. GPS said it saved us at least an hour. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm so thankful that even though it wasn't what I thought was right, even though it wasn't what the whole crowd was doing, even though it wasn't the easiest thing, that some higher power told me you might be wise to go a different direction. There's times when you just need to listen to the GPS. So can I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? My hope today was to give you a tool, maybe something that'll help you, it might help your family, it might give you a resource to help your kids. Like how do you think when you come to these moments where you have to make a decision, does it glorify God? Does it encourage other people? Does it draw me closer to God? But for some of you, this isn't just a timeless truth, it's a timely one. And you know that the Spirit is speaking to your heart and saying it's a, it's a good time for a change of direction. Or here's some clarity on the decision you need to make. Or here's some wisdom on how you should live. And right now in this moment, the Holy Spirit's speaking to you in this room, Auditorium 2, watching this on a screen somewhere, you're listening to the podcast. Would you listen to that voice of the Holy Spirit? Some of you right now, the Spirit is saying, don't go that way. Because it's going to destroy your family. It could even destroy your eternity. Some of you, the Spirit is pointing out things that if they continue to go the way they're going, for your children, for some people around you, it's going to trip them up in a way that just isn't wise. Some of you are finding yourself far from where you thought you were with God, maybe even in a dark place. And right now, Jesus is saying, come back to me. You don't have to do this on your own. You can come to me, and I'll give you life, and life to the full. Some of you know you're in a vulnerable place right now, and there are things that could pull you far away from God, and you just need to decide right now, not me, not today. Some of you are asking God for clarity. And right now, by his spirit, he's helping to give that to you. Father, thanks for your word. Holy Spirit, that you can take a, a verse from scripture that could just be confusing to us and you can make it life-giving. So God, we put you first. And would you help us to encourage other people and not to let ourselves get far from you. But may we live according to your word. May we make decisions as individuals and families in such a way that it glorifies you and allows your blessings, your favor to just be poured out into our lives. Lord, would you help us and go with us with your special favor and your wonderful peace and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Thanks for being here. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.